My name is Don Emerson. On behalf of the <clears throat> Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center's Southeast Asia program at Stanford, I am more than delighted to introduce our speaker today. He has an impressive and resonantly long, full name. Dr. Raden Mohammed Marty Muliana Natalagawa. But I've known him for many years and can guarantee that he is a man without pretensions and accordingly known by his friends simply as Marty, which makes things much easier. Marty Natalagawa served as Indonesia's Minister of Foreign Affairs from 2009 to 2014. He has had and continues to have a <clears throat> He has had and continues to have an outstanding, productive, and varied foreign policy career. He is presently Distinguished Fellow with the Asia Society Policy Institute here in the United States. Marty has been called, and I'm quoting, a visionary leader, a central player, and one of the most respected foreign policy and international security thinkers of his generation, not just in Indonesia, but in the entire Asia Pacific region. In 2012, for example, his emergency shuttle diplomacy successfully mediated a serious rift inside ASEAN regarding China's behavior in the South China Sea. Marty also helped secure Indonesia's ratification of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. In addition to his record as Indonesia's foreign minister, he has served his country in multiple high level diplomatic positions including as ambassador to the UN and the UK, and as his foreign ministry's director general for ASEAN cooperation. His scholarly credentials are no less impressive. A PhD from the Australian National University, an MPhil from the University of Cambridge, and a BSc from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Given the sheer breadth of Marty's qualifications, the title of this webinar is appropriately broad, Democracy, Diplomacy, Geopolitics, and the Future of Southeast Asia. The plan is for Marty to make opening remarks, for me to engage him in conversation, and for questions from the audience via the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Natalagawa, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Don. Thank you, uh, for you to you for inviting me and to the center, obviously, uh, to make this uh, mornings or this afternoon or this evenings, wherever you may happen to be uh, uh, possible. I am cons constantly in admiration of the center's work in promoting and the program's work in promoting greater understanding on uh, developments in the Asia Pacific and in Southeast Asia uh, in particular. Uh, you have been overly kind and generous in uh, your description just now, uh, pardon. And uh, likewise, I should like to begin uh, by acknowledging your uh, immense contribution uh, to an understanding of Indonesia in particular, but also beyond Indonesia of Southeast Asia uh, in many parts uh, of the world. Uh, today, I've been asked to share some thoughts and to converse with you on a, on a subject matter which I think ought to be of, of interest uh, to us all, uh, namely on democracy, on diplomacy, and geopolitics, uh, on and its, uh, their relationship to the future of uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, clearly, there are uh, as you said just now, Don, uh, extremely uh, wide topic and one perhaps may struggle in trying to find a common theme that uh, links uh, the question of uh, democracy, diplomacy and geopolitics, and especially uh, when they are being applied to a sub-region as diverse as uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, and let me begin by, by you know, reminding ourselves perhaps of uh, when we speak of Southeast Asia, we are really speaking or referring to what is, you know, to me, the very definition uh, of diversity. 
uh, uh, Southeast Asia, however one uh, dissects it, whether it be through its uh, uh, culture, ethnic background, to its um, history, the, its economic uh, disposition, and, and many other indices uh, really reflect uh, what we understand to be a diverse uh, uh, region. I think, as I said before, Southeast Asia to me uh, constitute or the very definition of uh, diversity. And, and such a uh, state of affairs is even more uh, reflected, I believe, in the sub themes that we are discussing today when we speak of uh, democracy, for instance. And we are reminded of how in Southeast Asia, uh, when we speak of uh, system of government, uh, system of, uh, of um, uh, the political system, we find such a varied uh, uh, and, and a very expansive continuum uh, between democracies uh, at one end and to less than open societies uh, in the other. Uh, on the other, and and clearly, uh, there is not one uh, size fits all uh, in terms of the political systems that the countries of Southeast Asia uh, pursue or, or, or align themselves with. So clearly, democracy uh, or system of governance is yet one one area where the, the diversity of, of Southeast Asia is uh, manifested. Uh, diplomacy and, is, and geopolitics, again, the sub-themes of our discussion uh, today. Again, uh, one is reminded of how uh, varied and how diverse uh, Southeast Asia's uh, outlook has been and continues to be. Uh, we have countries in Southeast Asia that pursues uh, different, type of, uh, different types of foreign policy orientations some align uh, to certain uh, major countries, whether it be United States or China, uh, others uh, seeking to pursue a more independent and a more active uh, non-aligned outlook, although this is increasingly becoming uh, difficult in the current environment. But the point that I wanted to suggest is that much like many other uh, domains, and many other facets, when we speak of uh, democracy or dem uh, systems of government, when we speak of diplomacy and geopolitics, foreign policy orientation, Southeast Asia is the very definition of uh, diversity. Mm -hmm. And yet quite remarkably, I think, and this is a point well worth uh, underscoring, uh, despite uh, such uh, diversity of, of, of character in Southeast Asia, uh, we have been witness to a remarkable development of a sense of regionalism in Southeast Asia. Um, arguably, Southeast Asia, uh, in terms of ASEAN, here by this I mean, uh, constitute or, or, or presents an example of one of the most uh, vibrant and one of the most successful uh, uh, um, example of the development of uh, regionalism uh, in the world today. Mm -hmm. ASEAN as um, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations as uh, promulgated in 1967 onwards have made possible um, remarkable transformation in Southeast Asia's dynamic. Uh, typically, I would mention, for instance, how uh, over the past decades, the uh, intra-Southeast Asia relationship have been transformed. Uh, a relationship that had once been marked by animosity, tensions, and, and distrust, uh, trust deficit perhaps, uh, is now marked by uh, strategic trust. Although problems continue to exist and issues continues to manifest, uh, in the final analysis, uh, the intra-Southeast Asian relations is, uh, is today far more conducive than it was uh, pre-ASEAN days when um, important bilaterals in Southeast Asia, uh, Indonesia involved in many of them, uh, were marked by a rather difficult uh, and, and negative uh, 
uh, sentiments. Mm -hmm. And of course, the economic transformation uh, that uh, Southeast Asian economies have undergone uh, over the past decades, making it now the fifth uh, biggest economy in the world, if combined, and, and in showing signs of in, in continued dynamism and a potential to uh, reach an even higher uh, uh, and greater gains. Uh, in other words, notwithstanding the type of diversity that I had tried to sketch at the beginning, uh, we have managed in our region to, uh, to create a sense of regionalism and, and uh, belonging to one common region, uh, especially through the ASEAN uh, modality. And here, I think, uh, in line with our, the theme of our discussion, uh, in the area of uh, diplomacy and geopolitics, and in the area of democracy even, uh, although far less uh, definite, uh, there are evidence of such uh, a regional approach uh, to those themes. On diplomacy and geopolitics, I did sketch, uh, I did suggest just now that uh, countries of Southeast Asia are marked by their uh, diversity of outlook on foreign policy issues, foreign policy orientations and alignments. And yet that notwithstanding, uh, we have been seeing over decades, uh, countries of Southeast Asia becoming even more um, coordinated in their foreign policy outlook. At the beginning, we saw, for instance, uh, countries of Southeast Asia, of ASEAN, pursuing a rather uh, minimalist and underwhelming neutrality uh, objectives. You know, the, when we speak of the zone of peace, freedom and neutrality of 1971, uh, in my view, the basic outlook at the time was uh, essentially uh, leave us alone uh, to the then raging Cold War uh, dynamic. Uh, we ask the major power to use the words in the Zofan to neutralize us, to neutralize Southeast Asia. That's to me is a, such a uh, uh, underwhelming ambition to simply please leave us alone in your uh, uh, contest between the East and the West. But as Southeast Asia began to consolidate and ASEAN began to consolidate, we begin to develop the notion of national and regional resilience, uh, strengthening the region's uh, capacity and stability and to withstand from uh, external interferences. And from regional resilience, we develop the notion of ASEAN centrality, uh, essentially the notion that ASEAN is at the forefront at the, in the driving seat role in managing and shaping and molding uh, not only Southeast Asia's affairs, but beyond Southeast Asia. Uh, and, and to me, there are a number of uh, reflections or manifestations of such a, uh, uh, such a uh, ambition by ASEAN in terms of its centrality. We saw the development of ASEAN's dialogue partner relationship with all the dialogue partners, including the United States, the development of ASEAN-led processes such as the ASEAN Regional Forum, the East Asia Summit, uh, and various other modalities essentially that uh, illustrate ASEAN centrality, ASEAN's at least uh, convening power. But more than convening power in the past, and, and I have to emphasize uh, that notion, in the past ASEAN have gone beyond convening power by trying to shape and mold the norms and principles that governs our region. The idea of Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, TAC, whereby countries of the region uh, commit themselves to resolve problems among them uh, in peaceful way rather than the use of force, uh, initially applying only among ASEAN member states, but an attempt has been made to universalize and to widen the scope of the TAC uh, principles. In essence, in diplomacy, in geopolitics, until recently, notwithstanding the, uh, the, uh, the division, the, the diversity of ASEAN foreign policy outlook, ASEAN has managed to develop some kind of a, a common external uh, outlook. On democracy, this is uh, far more uh, complex. 
because it would seem to me at the beginning uh, the notion of discussing and, and deliberating and developing a common view on issues such as commitment to democratic principles, to good governance, to human rights, uh, was not part of ASEAN's lexicon. Uh, ASEAN traditionally has always been uh, pride itself in terms of the principles such as non-interference, uh, clear distinction between internal and external issues, and therefore it would be quite foreign and quite alien uh, even to discuss such issues within the ASEAN context. And it took Indonesia's leadership uh, back in 2002-2003 to actually akin or, or concurrently with Indonesia's democratic transformation uh, to bring such subject matters to ASEAN's uh, discussion. Uh, by introducing the idea of an ASEAN political security community, uh, coming up with an ASEAN charter that recognizes uh, on paper uh, commitment to democratic principles, human rights and good governance, uh, promulgation of such institutions as, as the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, essentially through persistent and patient uh, uh, prodding and pushing, uh, Indonesia sought to make uh, the idea of political development, political security development, uh, and to be part and parcel of ASEAN's uh, discussion. And, and that is now very much manifested in formally in many ASEAN uh, written commitments, declarations, and even uh, charter itself, a people-centered ASEAN, so to speak. In other words, again, uh, notwithstanding the, uh, the diversity that I had mentioned before, even in the area of diplomacy and geopolitics and human rights and democracy, uh, there's been some, uh, some more successful than others, uh, development of ASEAN sense, of Southeast Asia sense of uh, regionalism. Having said all that, however, I feel that there is a, a real risk of uh, complacency if we simply rest on those uh, gains alone. If there is a sense that what had been achieved in the past uh, will, 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 is now consolidated and can be assumed and not much further effort is needed. Uh, we, I am of the view that currently ASEAN is at a critical juncture uh, in many areas that I had cited before uh, that will determine whether it will continue to prosper or whether it will wither, uh, whether it continues to matter or whether it becomes increasingly uh, irrelevant. Uh, and at the risk of oversimplification, and, and I will end soon, uh, Don, um, in my view, there are at least two types of uh, key issues that ASEAN must try to uh, make itself relevant and address uh, itself. Uh, one is the more traditional type. Uh, that is that ASEAN has been quite, quite um, well, well disposed in managing in the past, uh, namely how to respond to geopolitical shifts uh, and change. Uh, you know, I mean, it is a misnomer, it is a false assumption uh, if we are to say that the situation that ASEAN is facing today, the US-China uh, dynamic and many other dynamic, geopolitical dynamic is uh, singularly the most um, you know, critical task or test that ASEAN has ever faced because ASEAN has had to deal with geopolitical push and pull all throughout its existence. And, and we have managed to respond uh, to those. But today we have US-China dynamic that I don't have to go through in terms of uh, its manifestation, uh, except to say that it is not only traditional in terms of political security, but also now all pervasive uh, in the uh, financial, economic, uh, technology sector, uh, where ASEAN basically, uh, in my view, is uh, task uh, or challenge to respond beyond saying 
don't force us uh, to choose. I find uh, such a disposition to simply say, uh, leave us alone, uh, don't make us choose between Beijing or Washington, or at best a call for restraint, call for uh, expression, I mean, expression of concern, they are rather underwhelming uh, and does not meet uh, the required uh, type of response uh, by an ASEAN that claims uh, centrality. Uh, in other words, in my view, uh, the current sets of leadership in ASEAN must try to, to concretize, to manifest in real policy actions, actionable steps, uh, how do they respond to these geopolitical shifts? And it's not only US and China. Uh, you have in our region, um, you know, when we speak of the Indo-Pacific, for instance, uh, relationship between India and, and China, for instance, uh, that has become increasingly difficult. Uh, relationship between China and Japan, even Japan and the Republic of Korea have, has had its uh, difficult moments and, and many other uh, difficult uh, dynamics. Uh, potential for conflicts in our region is quite prevalent. The South China Sea, the, the Straits, Northeast Asia, the Andaman Sea, the Straits of Malacca, these are areas that are uh, constantly uh, prone to uh, uh, difficult dynamics. So in my view, there is a need for ASEAN to deliver on its centrality, to have a very meticulous and a very precise definition of the problem and try to find a solution to it. Uh, for instance, is the problem, uh, one obvious problem is the question of trust deficit that I speak of before. Uh, the fact that US and China, US and Russia uh, find it difficult even to decipher intent. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the risk for miscalculation because of worst case assumptions of the other's behavior is, is extremely high uh, today. And this notwithstanding the uh, promulgation of so many ASEAN-led processes, the ASEAN Regional Forum, the East Asia Summit, uh, there is a paradox of plenty. We have processes, but when it comes to it, uh, there is still prevalence of trust deficit. Uh, in my humble view, the idea of a common commitment by countries of the region beyond Southeast Asia to peaceful settlement of disputes, uh, not, not wishing the disputes away, they are very real and they are very complex and, and complicated, but a commitment at the highest level uh, that says that uh, this not, notwithstanding, they are committed to solve these problems by diplomacy would have an immediate uh, decompressing effect uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, trying to minimize uh, the risk of conflict. So that is, that is why I have been calling, I have been hoping that the, a TAC-like commitment can be extrapolated and can be projected uh, beyond ASEAN. And secondly, the crisis management capacity. Uh, we have a crisis happening in, in our part of the world and incidences, and yet we really don't have a timely, uh, a time sensitive crisis management capacity. We have your regular ASEAN meetings, uh, foreign ministers and, and summit, but they are uh, you know, so regular in their nature that it becomes uh, almost uh, sometimes irrelevant and post-event, uh, post-crisis in their, in their nature. And as if they are uh, giving a running commentary to something that had occurred before. And what especially uh, uh, bothers me a lot, uh, somewhat, uh, for instance, in recent, in recent weeks, we saw uh, the ASEAN foreign ministers uh, failing. This, these are the foreign ministers. These are ministers who are uh, full-time uh, responsible for the management of foreign policy issues in our region, uh, couldn't get past and manage to meet in a retreat informal, supposedly informal retreat format for one reason or another. And to me that uh, seems almost like uh, abdication uh, of uh, responsibility. Uh, we have so many issues brewing at the moment, Myanmar, et cetera, 
uh, these are precisely the time uh, when uh, ministers need to get together and, and, and not to try to make things overly complicated, but to have diplomacy uh, right. at, at the forefront. Right. And my, uh, the second uh, nexus or the second dynamic that, that I think that ASEAN must try to uh, address, the first one is vis -vis geopolitics. The second one is perhaps more in-house to ASEAN. How do we uh, uh, synergize the notion or the principle of non-interference and commitment to human rights and democratic principles? And this is a perennial challenge and that one that I thought ASEAN had, had uh, successfully managed when it introduced the notion of ASEAN political security community, that it is not a zero sum. It is not an either or mm -hmm. that one can and one must yeah. uh, promote and respect democratic principles. And at the same time, this can be done in a manner consistent with the idea of uh, respect for right. territorial integrity, respect for non-interference. Yeah. And that type of very nuanced and calibrated approach that had been very uh, carefully built over mm -hmm. years now mm -hmm. has uh, uh, has uh, collapsed uh, because of the type of approaches being taken on Myanmar, uh, for instance, as if uh, there is only one or the other approach, uh, mm -hmm. that there is not enough uh, 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 agile, uh, ability to be agile and to be, to, be, to be responsive. And my final, final point, pardon, is that uh, unfortunately, while Conceptually, I try to define the two just now, geopolitics and democracy as being two separate challenge. They are actually uh, often uh, extremely correlated and, and connected. For instance, in the, whenever countries like the United States, uh, for instance, try to promote the notion of democratic partnership, democratic uh, 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 promotion and protection of democratic uh, governance, um, in, uh, it is difficult to, uh, to avoid uh, the impression, uh, to avoid it becoming embroiled in geopolitical dynamics. Uh, mm -hmm. As soon as it's right. not the message, right. it's the messenger. Uh, as soon as the United States take up the issue, uh, the other side, namely China, Beijing, uh, deem this to be a US-led effort to undermine mm -hmm. China's interests. Right. And, and, and therefore, even the space, the democratic space, uh, conversation on democratic principles becomes weaponized, uh, mm. becomes uh, uh, part and parcel of a geopolitical push and, and pull. Hence, all the more reason for a group of countries like ASEAN to have its own uh, right. blueprint, to mm. have its own uh, ideas on the matter so that they don't become uh, uh, you know, part upon Pawns of U.S., China, or whatever major countries' uh, dynamics uh, uh, rivalries. Yeah. Uh, having said all that, I am not. An, I am perennially optimistic in my in my outlook. Um, the obituary on ASEAN have been written many times over in the past. Uh, pardon, as you are extremely uh, aware, well aware, and uh, that notwithstanding, ASEAN or Southeast Asia have always. Uh, uh, proved able to, uh, to, um, to reinvent itself and to make itself relevant. Uh, mm -hmm. And I should have said uh, uh, just now in my, in my initial remarks uh, that when we speak of ASEAN and Southeast Asia, in the past, it used to be thought as being uh, one and the same. Uh, but obviously today, it's not necessarily one and the same, uh, at least, at the very least, given the fact that Timor-Leste uh, is not a member of ASEAN mm -hmm. just yet. Uh, I do remember, and this is my own failing, uh, my own personal failing uh, in wanting, in pushing for the, uh, the uh, entry of Timor-Leste to ASEAN. And certainly it was something that Indonesia put a great deal of efforts in in 2011. And I hope in 2023, when Indonesia once again uh, chair ASEAN, uh, we can help create an ASEAN 11 rather than 10 in having Timor-Leste uh, very much part and parcel of the ASEAN family. Terima kasih, Pak Padon. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was a uh, uh, long, lengthier. No, 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 that's right. <laughs> no, 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 I really appreciate it because you've actually started 
not only with a historical overview of ASEAN so that we can kind of get, you know, remember that the crisis, if I'm not misusing that term, I think it is a crisis, as you, you referred to it as a critical juncture. Yes, I think it is a crisis that faces ASEAN today. It's vital that we put that in historical perspective because ASEAN has in many respects succeeded as a process, mm -hmm. as a process that generates product. In other words, changing behavior as a consequence of the process, that's been much more difficult. Mm -hmm. And I don't wish to, you know, I, frankly, I can remember days, you know, before the pandemic visiting Washington and talking to people in the US government who basically said, well, you know, ASEAN, what is ASEAN? It's a talk shop, nothing else, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm. that was not the official view of the American government. And I think people who understood ASEAN better understood that, my heavens, Southeast Asia is, I've argued, the most diverse region in the entire world. Mm -hmm. uh, how could you possibly expect a region like that with so many languages and religions and cultures and political differences and so forth to come together as one and, and generate major changes in, 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 in the world? Um, so I'm very sympathetic with the historical overview, but I also appreciate your concern because right now, it seems to me, that's what we really have when we look at ASEAN. We have concern, right? And, and let, me be, let me be very specific. Let's just take one particular instance, the South China Sea. Now we could spend the whole time talking about the South China Sea. The South China Sea is the heart water you know, if Indonesia calls itself the Tana Air, the land water, then ar arguably in regional terms, the South China Sea is the heart water of Southeast Asia. You mentioned the, the success of the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. Yes, absolutely. I was in Bali when Brazil signed the treaty of all countries. Brazil, which is not next door to Indonesia or even anywhere near Southeast Asia. So it was a diplomatic success. But I have to say at the same time, that there were proposals, uh, and I'll mind you, academics, unlike diplomats, tend to be perhaps uh, a little too imaginative and unwilling to recognize the realities of a situation that makes their, their recommendations perhaps uh, very, very difficult to implement. But the idea was born in conversations. I remember I was in Hanoi once for an ASEAN meeting, um, suggested this myself. Uh, uh, other colleagues have spoken of this. Why not have a treaty of amity and cooperation in maritime Southeast Asia. In other words, that ASEAN would in fact try to do something to improve the situation in the South China Sea and to deal with this problem of claims by Southeast Asian countries, which conflict with each other and therefore enable China to divide and rule. China can thereby split Southeast Asia, which is exactly what it's done. You know, you have Cambodia, uh, you know, in one position, you have Indonesia in a very different position. I could go through all the, the differences here. Um, ASEAN is divided on the South China Sea. And frankly, the notion of, uh, you know, reaching some kind of outcome has been postponed by China, uh, if I may say this, uh, time and time and time and time again. Yeah. Um, so, it, just specifically with regard to the South China Sea, don't you think it would be a good idea if the members of ASEAN who have claims in the South China Sea got together and settled those claims first, and then they could face chi China as a united front? Wouldn't that make sense? Well, and is that well, possible? Is, yeah. Well, I'm 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 glad you 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 uh, you know I mean you come up with such a, such innovative ideas and 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 thoughts, uh, but don't because it's something that we are at the moment, in my view. Uh, lacking in terms of, in terms of, you know, having to, uh, where do we take the the, uh, the discussions on the South China Sea at the moment? First and foremost, I remember when Indonesia began to raise the the uh, discussions on the South China Sea in ASEAN, in in uh, uh, Southeast Asia, in the early early well mid 1990s uh, onward. You know, and we were trying to be anticipated by saying, look, this is an emerging problem that we need to manage. Uh, many in Southeast Asia, including in ASEAN, uh, really uh, took issue with it. They say that this is a, a non-issue, uh, a non uh, something that Indonesia was being overly concerned. But you know, because of our anticipatory outlook, and we built the, the notion of 
an ASEAN, common ASEAN view in the subject matter. So hence we have the Manila Declaration 2002 and the DOC uh, 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 Declaration of Conduct on the South China Sea, not only between ASEAN, but ASEAN and China. And building that sense of common ownership, ASEAN common ownership on the South China Sea took a great deal of efforts because not, not obviously, not all Southeast Asian countries have an, uh, a direct uh, uh, interest or direct uh, disputes uh, in the South China Sea, but we, want, we, we worked hard in making sure that that notwithstanding, uh, we have a common interest and common view in, in managing that potential for conflict. And this is where I think it's beginning to, to fray at the moment, beginning to, 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 to become, to be somewhat undermined. There's beginning to be evidence of uh, 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 like a, a la carte approach. Uh, some countries feel, well, the South China Sea issue is a problem for some more than for, than for others. Right. And, and this is one, one that is now undermining uh, ASEAN's approach. Uh, I remember, for, for about 10 years, ASEAN was, uh, was not able to make progress on the so-called uh, guidelines on the declaration of conduct the, on the DOC, uh, because China insisted, they say that before ASEAN meet, uh, ASEAN, uh, ASEAN cannot meet amongst themselves on the South China Sea uh, without, uh, with China, unless you meet first with China. So I was saying, what, what is it to them? This is an internal, uh, internal ASEAN uh, yeah. affairs for ASEAN to consolidate its position. And that's why we, we managed in the end to, to have uh, an ASEAN position on the code of conduct, et cetera. But uh, increasingly now it is becoming a little bit more uh, uh, differentiated the level of interest on the South China Sea on the negotiation or the, on the code of conduct, for instance, it is, to my knowledge, not ASEAN position, common and China. Uh, instead, is the 10 ASEAN member states position and China. In other words, mm -hmm. each ASEAN mm -hmm. countries have their own square mm -hmm. brackets uh, mm -hmm. on the South China, on the code of conduct vis-a-vis uh, mm -hmm. China, rather than having a common 10 ASEAN position. So mm -hmm. uh, it is. this is ultimately, first and foremost, a political problem. Uh, within ASEAN that they must uh, not allow themselves to be to be dissected. And that's why when you made reference to it in 2012, when ASEAN began to show some disunity on the side, well, not begun, it showed disunity on the subject matter, uh, Indonesia invested a great deal of efforts to quickly restore it because otherwise yeah, it, it, it will undermine uh, ASEAN's, uh, you know, stature and 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 relevance in our region, but at the Marty, moment, it Marty, is I have to I have to interrupt. <laughs> I want yeah. to point out to the audience that you are being very self-effacing when you say Indonesia. You really mean Marty Natalagawa because you were the one after the disaster in Cambodia, right? Who traveled around? You did emergency shuttle diplomacy, uh, and you really rescued ASEAN from that embarrassment. And, and I appreciate and, I appreciate your comment that that the South China Sea ultimately involves the individual countries because you know I mean after all you know Laos doesn't have a coast right so what interest would it have and so you're absolutely right but what this means in a way is that the centrality of ASEAN rather than being a shibboleth a kind of mantra that we all must believe in I think it makes sense to recognize that there are certain problems including the South China Sea that perhaps are beyond the settlement capacity of ASEAN, given the diversity inside ASEAN, but ASEAN could at least establish some principles, uh, general principles that could be observed by the individual, by the individual countries. And, and this gets into the difference between diplomacy and institutional reform. They're not the mm -hmm. same. You know, we can have all the diplomacy in the world, but arguably ASEAN needs institutional reform. Uh, for example, the idea that the Secretary General should have more power. I remember Secretaries General saying to me, you know, frankly, I'm more of a Secretary than a General, <laughs> right? Because the position is so constrained, right? And I also remember, you know, hearing the argument that, oh, no, 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 Professor Emerson, you misunderstand. ASEAN is not a supranational organization. It's a, it's a coming together of sovereign governments. Don't expect too much. Okay, well, I won't expect too much. 
But then if it's not ASEAN, who is going to respond to the kinds right. of crises that we, that we see? Right. Um, right. And in this regard, perhaps ASEAN is being held back by the ASEAN way, mm -hmm. which amounts to a kind, I mean, exaggerating a little bit, the requirement of unanimity before mm -hmm. action can be taken. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that the European Union has avoided that problem, mm -hmm. to some extent at least, not entirely, by all kinds of arrangements in terms of, you know, weighting the votes and, you know, what's urgent, what's not urgent and so forth, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Why couldn't the ASEAN way be amended in order to make ASEAN more effective, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. after all, it's, it's because of the ASEAN way that Cambodia, for example, is able to block any resolution coming out of ASEAN that's critical of China. And I'm not saying that ASEAN should be <clears throat> critical <clears throat> of China as a matter of principle. Uh, no, but it seems to me that that should be part of the ability of ASEAN uh, in order to play a role in, in, in the region. What do you think? Well, I, I, I mean, clearly uh, the institutions or the decision-making process uh, modality in ASEAN, uh, they matter. Uh, they matter in terms of uh, whether it would be more likely or less likely for ASEAN to be able to effect, I mean, to, to initiate concrete uh, action. And I, I hear those who have said uh, approaches such as the consensus decision, decision making, et cetera, have made it impossible uh, for ASEAN uh, to act uh, in, a, in a very, uh, 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 in, a, in a more urgent manner. But at the same time, you know, I mean, I, I hesitate a little bit uh, in uh, assuming that there is like a magic wand, as if all we need is some legalistic uh, 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 institutional reform, <laughs> amendment of the charter, for instance, uh, the decision-making uh, modality process, and as a result, uh, all will be well and that ASEAN will be able to take uh, effective uh, action. Uh, to those, some of my colleagues in ASEAN who, who speak of this view, and they say we need to open up the charter again for potential review in that direction. Uh, in my, I, I'm a little bit cautious because I think to open up that Pandora's box, uh, institutional reform in the current Southeast Asian uh, climate, uh, I think does not guarantee progressive <laughs> development of ASEAN it could arguably lead to regression uh, given the current constituent uh, member states, uh, the dynamics that's now prevalent in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. uh, instead of a progressive development of the charter, progressive development of its ASEAN's uh, 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 more, 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 I don't want to use the term supranational, but more uh, 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 able uh, to take independent decision uh, character. It could be the other way around. But in my view, I think ultimately is, you know, I mean, it's the way the diploma, there is diplomacy matters too. I mean, you can have all the significant uh, promising institutional uh, setup, but if it's not uh, backed up by the requisite diplomatic uh, 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 outlook and diplomatic uh, <clears throat> uh, capacities, it won't get uh, anywhere. For instance, you know, I mean, you refer to the Secretary General of ASEAN uh, uh, um, being more secretary rather than general. Uh, in recent months, uh, in recent in the past year, for instance, we have been hearing as well on the role of the chair of ASEAN. Uh, you know, on the Myanmar issue, uh, when the, where when it was the chair of Myanmar of ASEAN being Brunei and now Cambodia, um, I feel. Uh, you know, there is often perfection can be the enemy of the good. Mm -hmm. uh, when you are testing the waters, uh, looking at possibilities, you have to give room uh, to whoever is taking the, making the effort uh, to have some space right. uh, to test and prod ideas. And, and you can't at every turn, at every step, uh, undermine and question uh, the approach that's being, uh, being made. You know, in two, you refer to 2012. When 2012 happened, South China Sea and, and, and all that with ASEAN, inability to have unity, uh, Indonesia wasn't chair of ASEAN. It doesn't have any legal uh, ASEAN charter mandated responsibility or, or rights to do whatever. 
but we just felt this is not right. So that's why when things happen, we immediately uh, you know, get our act together and try to re re restore ASEAN unity. In 2011, when Thailand and Cambodia uh, nearly went to war uh, uh, over its border issues, uh, within hours, I was already on the plane from, mm -hmm. from Jakarta to go to Bangkok and to go to Phnom Penh to try to manage the issue. Uh, because I felt that was the mandate that a chair of ASEAN inherently possessed. Uh, you know, because if you were to wait and send letters going back and forth, do you agree, do you not agree? Uh, the moment can pass you by. So I think it's yeah. not, well, institu the framework institutions matter, but I think uh, there is not a magic wand, it's more the, the, the uh, diplomatic heft the diplomatic uh, commitment uh, and 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 of, of member states of ASEAN, like I mentioned before, to me, uh, given the state of the world where we are today on Myanmar and many other issues, for ASEAN foreign ministers, for instance, a uh, couple of weeks ago, uh, deciding not to meet uh, in their traditional retreat for whatever reason, uh, is a little bit difficult to to. <laughs> To, to understand. I know that they need to make a point about uh, the attendance or otherwise of Myanmar, but to close up shop uh, as a consequence, uh, you know, given the current developments to me, is a little bit uh, uh, difficult to accept. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. And I think you have prepared for, you know, my next uh, comment or question, uh, if, if I could. Um, Indonesia will chair ASEAN next year. I think it's highly unlikely that the Myanmar problem, which mm. is such a tremendous challenge mm. and directly involves ASEAN's relationship to democracy, uh, not to mention stability. Mm. I mean, can you imagine perhaps, who knows, uh, the president of Indonesia might say, Marty, I want you to go around the region. It's time for some more shuttle diplomacy. And I want you to try to establish some baselines inside ASEAN so that we can avoid the Myanmar problem splitting ASEAN to the point that we can't even hold a meeting because some of us would be so embarrassed by having to sit at the same table, mm -hmm. right? With the gentleman, if I can use that term, which I probably should not use, who runs the country uh, at the moment, um, you know, <laughs> uh, Min Ong Lang is, has got blood dripping from his hands. I mean, what are we talking about? 1,500 people, perhaps more, who have been effectively murdered. I use that word advisedly. Certainly mm -hmm. killed, right, by this regime. Their own citizens, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is absolutely a catastrophic situation. It means that ASEAN is increasingly going to be regarded you know, not so much as, you know, a do nothing organization, which I think you've already clearly demonstrated is unfair, unfair, mm -hmm. but a club of dictators uh, that refuse to deal with this problem. I mean, the junta in Myanmar could, could do tremendous damage, uh, not only to ASEAN's reputation, but to its very ability to meet together and to make uh, decisions. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's time for you know, Marty Natalagawa to get back on the airplane. <laughs> what do you think? No, no, I mean, uh, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I'm a great uh, believer in informal, uh, quiet uh, diplomacy uh, of the type, someone like uh, Pamohtar Kusumat Maja, uh, our foreign minister and Pali Alatas, have been great proponent of uh, to be able to to uh, to test ideas uh, away from the limelight quietly and diligently and try to find solutions as we did for instance indonesia did on the conflict in cambodia and many other situations and perhaps uh, i'm not uh, uh, well versed in the diplomacy of modern day where every step of the way that whatever step that you're taking must be a Twitter informed and Instagram informed to the rest of the world. Uh, I'm not sure whether that is something that I'm, I'm capable of doing, but 
uh, to your point, what I'm reminded of uh, uh, more, more importantly, Pa, is that you know what, whether it be Myanmar or elsewhere, uh, it is a, it's a process uh, of uh, uh, you know when you speak of democratization, uh, it is a process. It's not an event, uh, and Indonesia and all the ASEAN member states for years have invested a great deal of efforts and political capital in pushing for reform in, in Myanmar, because as you well remember, at one time, Myanmar also very much preoccupied ASEAN's attention. Many ASEAN meetings were uh, you know, uh, monopolized by, by concern on Myanmar. And that's why we put a great deal of effort and bilaterally, Indonesia had a lot to share with Myanmar because we, we are not dissimilar in terms of the composition of the country, a country that is uh, uh, quite diverse with different push and pull from the different regions. Uh, we also had a prominent role of our armed forces in our history in the past before. And yet we proved that we are able to transition uh, to democracy, that uh, mm -hmm. to decentralization, uh, increase actually strengthen our national unity and as well to have a modern armed forces in a democratic setting uh, and to be honest uh, to what I'm, I'm aware during the time that I was still active uh, we great, put a great deal of effort in 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 building confidence and and, and sh you know sharing lessons learned with Myanmar I'm not sure to what extent uh, such an effort had been made in recent years, uh, whether uh, whether that, that kind of activities is deemed to be something that is useful. But as a result, we are where we are in terms of the, the reawakening of the crisis uh, in Myanmar. At the moment for Indonesia, as it approaches its uh, center, uh, chairmanship year, you know, I mean, uh, we need to get back to be able to manage some potentially uh, uh, conflicting goals. Clearly on the democratization process, on the coup, etc., we are clearly uh, uh, on the side of wanting uh, the, the, uh, the results of the coup to be, to be, to be, to be, uh, to be announced and, and, and for democracy to be restored. And we have spoken eloquently on that. But at the same time, <laughs> we need to maintain ASEAN unity. Uh, and, and this is where I think it's, it's not often easy to be able to have conflicting uh, objectives. It is easy to pursue one uh, over the other, just relentlessly, whether it be democracy or ASEAN unity. But in the past, in the past, we have been able to achieve both at the same time. Whatever the goal we have, or whether it be South China Sea, yeah. Thailand, Cambodia, ASEAN reform, uh, the type of leadership Indonesia exercise was a transformative leadership that right. at the same time brings unity to ASEAN uh, rather than a leadership that is uh, makes us uh, satisfied internally that we are promoting certain concepts and ideals yeah. but at the same time bringing the house ASEAN house uh, into disrepute. This but is Marty, where we are Marty, if I may hmm. say so, you're right about Indonesia, uh, absolutely. And uh, that brings me back to the point, Indonesia is going to be the chair of ASEAN next year. And so let's get really specific. In other words, mm -hmm. presumably one advantage that you have, since you are no longer foreign minister, you are not bound as a, as a, yeah, a civil, not just a civil servant, but a leading figure in the government of Indonesia. Obviously there are certain things you can't say. You're not fully in what we would call track three, right? Now these are the the irresponsible academics such as myself that can just shoot off at the mouth and say anything they want. You know, I mean, um, let's try to be a little creative here. Here's a specific proposal. Okay, what do you think of it? I'm, I'm looking for specific ideas, recommendations, proposals. You know, it's Lenin's question. What is to be done? What is to be done? We know that ASEAN at least has agreed on a five point consensus with regard to Myanmar. For those of the, uh, us that may not have it you know, in the front of their minds, let me just repeat that. Number one, end the violence now. Number two, dialogue among all parties. Notice all parties. That would presumably include the NUG, the National Unity Government, right? In the mm -hmm. opposition, right? 
not to mention the NLD and so forth. Probably the PDFs as well, the People's Defense Forces, I'm not sure. Number three, to allow humanitarian assistance to come into the country. Um, we could talk about that, that's perhaps, anyway. Number four, that there be a special ASEAN envoy. There is a special ASEAN envoy, controversial, but anyway, and that the envoy must be able to visit Myanmar and talk to the right people. Okay, so there are five points there. What about the argument that if Myanmar agrees to all five points, then we will not bar them from attending ASEAN meetings. Now, the question of whether you know, Min Aung Lang would attend as opposed to perhaps someone lower down. The, the phrase non-political is used here, although presumably even lower down, you've got to be political because you're part of a junta after all, right? And maybe one could even break that down and say, you know, let's take, let's take the top two, end violence now and a dialogue between all parties, including the opposition, right? Mm -hmm. if, if Myanmar were to agree to those two uh, proposals, and, and the response from ASEAN would be, okay, fine, that's a beginning, you can attend the meeting, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and if they don't agree, then ASEAN says, I'm very sorry, you know, we wish you were here. Uh, <laughs> you'll be here in spirit, you know, whatever that means, right? Mm -hmm. But no, we have to take care of this problem. The, mm -hmm. the unity of ASEAN requires a seeming, an appearance of disunity which is actually very functional because only that appearance of disunity is going to bring about the unity that will enable ASEAN to continue, you know, as a united organization, a relatively united organization. So that's a specific idea. What about that? Or maybe there are other specific policy proposals, mm -hmm. not generalizations about, you know, we need more diplomacy or whatever, obviously, but yeah. is that helpful or what do you think well, about that? I'm, what you, I'm, you know, what you said just now, uh, Don, really, really, well, pinpoint the type of the reasons and the type of uh, clarity of action uh, that is needed by ASEAN uh, uh, today in terms of to demonstrate uh, its relevance. Just to take, I mean, on the issue of special envoy, et cetera, obviously something that is, uh, that must satisfy various uh, tests, the tests of, uh, from the chair's uh, comfort level the test of uh, acceptance by the parties uh, in, 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 in Myanmar itself, et cetera, et cetera. But that's something uh, not for me to, to, to speculate. But on, on your point, for instance, the first point, the ending of violence. Um, it is at the moment a, a principle, uh, one of the points in the five point uh, consensus, but has ASEAN made any concrete um, efforts to try to secure uh, that ending of violence. If not secure, at least to monitor uh, uh, that ending of violence. Uh, I think there is plenty of many bullet points that can be identified mm -hmm. to develop ASEAN's capacity, uh, even symbolic or an ASEAN that is seen to be, to be on top of that effort. For instance, are the ASEAN embassies in Yangon, not in Yangon, in Napidao, able to constitute themselves to some kind, having some kind of a observant, observer capacity? I don't want to use the term an ASEAN peacekeeping force. I don't want to use the term an ASEAN observer mission. But the objective of the first, the ending of violence, especially if correlated with the idea of creating conditions conducive for the delivery of humanitarian aid, uh, can foresee a situation of some kind of a visible ASEAN uh, presence uh, on the ground in Myanmar, for instance. It could be political, it could be uh, other type of monitors. Uh, in Aceh, for instance, when we had uh, the conflict in Aceh, although we did not uh, uh, take, take advantage of an ASEAN modality, we purposefully invited countries from ASEAN, the Philippines, uh, Malaysia, Brunei, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> uh, Thailand, uh, to help uh, observe the, the uh, cessation of hostilities, uh, the humanitarian pause that we had with the GAM, with the Aceh uh, uh, separatist yeah. movement. Right. Right. Uh, so I think, you know, I mean, at the moment that 
to your point in terms of concrete points, concrete uh, policy actions, that first element, uh, cessation of hostilities, is extremely reliant on uh, the, the junta doing their thing. Uh, there is not an attempt by ASEAN to ask itself what can they do to ensure uh, whether I mean to first of all to observe whether it's being observed whether it's being whether it's being respected right. or even uh, well, as the case may may require to secure uh, such a cessation of violence uh, of hostilities and and that is just one example and and can quickly be connected can be connected with the third condition. Uh, uh, requirement for the delivery of humanitarian aid uh, to to um, to, uh, to uh, Myanmar because clearly it requires climate conducive uh, for 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 uh, for that to take place. Yeah. But uh, whatever it, I mean on the on the uh, dialogue uh, with all parties, um, you know I mean <laughs> what has actually individual ASEAN member states done openly and publicly? openly and publicly to reach out to the NUG. I don't think, I mean, they say there is rumor that they have been uh, supposedly been in contact informally, but why not make it formal? Yeah. Because, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's formal enough. I mean, it's relatively open enough that they meet with the junta leader. Uh, the junta leader even uh, came to the ASEAN secretariat to meet. Why aren't, if not ASEAN collectively, why aren't influential ASEAN member states publicly and openly uh, meet with the representative of the NUG uh, right. to say, look, we are now as part and parcel of a point two or point three point two, uh, we are establishing contacts. Um, and, and by the way, I think there is an important, in my personal humble opinion, and there is an important difference in not wanting to have the junta leader uh, take part in ASEAN summits and ASEAN meetings. That is a position that ASEAN has taken. And I think it is quite correct that uh, they, he should not be able to attend until uh, the, there's some progress made on the five points. But that doesn't mean that the ASEAN chair, uh, especially the, the person of the special envoy who concurrently happens to be the uh, Cambodia as well, uh, to have processes uh, with the all parties in Myanmar, including to visit Yangon, to meet the junta and hopefully right. to meet the other leaders because I mean, you can't right. desist communication altogether. Otherwise uh, the whole thing just grind to a halt. So I think yeah. it yeah. is separate. Uh, right. The idea of the junta not attending the summit, I completely agree. They need to prove that they, they have delivered or they are delivering on the five points, but that doesn't mean that the ASEAN chair right. Yes, uh, should should not be allowed to communicate. Yeah. Uh, we get it already. We are saying all these communications is not conferring uh, legal conferring recognition. Uh, let's get that out of the way. But then the ASEAN chair and the ASEAN envoy must be allowed to do their thing without right. being constantly uh, micromanaged and to say, oh, you haven't talked to me before you went there. Just let them do the thing. This is how in right. the past like on Cambodian conflict, someone like uh, uh, the late Mokhtar Kusumat Maja was able to initiate the cocktail party between the different warring factions mm -hmm. in Cambodia mm -hmm. yeah. because they were they had independent of action. So yeah. I think those two, the non-appearance, the non-participation of the junta yeah. at the summit, 100% correct, but yeah. it doesn't mean that the ASEAN chair should yeah. not engage. and to fill the deficit at the moment, all the engagement have been on the junta. It would make a tremendous difference if tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, right. if any of the ASEAN member states publicly and openly right. have right. a meeting with the NUG. I think, that's a, I think that's a terrific idea. And I hope this conversation will be remembered as the, as the <laughs> birthplace of that idea. It's a terrific idea, absolutely. And I think that brings us to the Q and A. Uh, it's uh, really appreciate the conversation so far very much. Scott Marcial will ask the first question live, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I do have a number of questions piled up in the Q and A, uh, and I will select from them, and we can continue after Scott has asked you his question. Scott is a visiting practitioner fellow uh, with the Asia Pacific Research Center. 
Uh, he was the U.S. ambassador, as you know, to Myanmar from 2016 to 2020. He served earlier as ambassador to Indonesia during the years that you were the country's foreign minister. So I think it's altogether appropriate that Scott have an opportunity to ask the first question in the Q&A. Scott? Thanks very much, Don. Uh, minister, it's good to see you. Um, nice. I think I always will have to call you minister since you were minister <laughs> when I was there. I, I can't refer to you as Pop Marty. I, I hope that's okay. Um, thanks very much for all the really interesting and thoughtful comments. Thoughtful, I should say, as always. I, I wanted to, to, I guess, continue a little bit the conversation about ASEAN and Myanmar. Um, because in, in, in my view, um, first, I, I think the Myanmar situation is not one that any outside entity, including ASEAN, can quote, solve. It's mm. incredibly difficult. Um, but I think for ASEAN, to me, it presents two challenges. One, the challenge in a way to ASEAN centrality of being, quote, unable to resolve this problem. But second, the problem of it being a member state of ASEAN. And so one of the 10 ASEAN members who the rest of the world want to deal with is you know, deeply problematic uh, mm -hmm. understatement. Um, and, you know, you can compare it, as you said, Minister, back to the 2007, 8, 9 period after Saffron Revolution. Mm -hmm. I would argue it's, it's a much more severe situation now because the junta has no legitimacy and really zero public support back home. I mean, it, it really is not in any way a legitimate government. So the question is uh, twofold. One, Assuming, as I think a lot of people in Myanmar and a lot of experts on Myanmar do assume, that sadly this crisis is likely to continue for quite some time, one, two years, or even more. Over time, does this presence of this deeply problematic junta, does that put more pressure on ASEAN internally? Um, and second, um, is there anything else that ASEAN should think about doing? I mean, you mentioned engaging either as individual countries or as ASEAN with uh, the NUG, which is a, certainly a, a worthwhile idea. But given how the, the, be, the basically criminal behavior of this junta, I have to just put it that way. There's no other way I can describe it. Should ASEAN be thinking of even more dramatic measures? Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Pascot. Uh, a great delight to see you, although only on the screen. Uh, you are one of those uh, with very, very uh, uh, important experience and skill set, having served both in Myanmar and uh, Indonesia. And you have always been a true friend, not only of, of the two countries, but also of ASEAN in general. And 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 since uh, you have continued to, to, to be engaged on matters of the region. And I, I really appreciate your, your definition of, of the challenge, which I agree uh, uh, fully uh, that the Myanmar issue uh, constitute a test to ASEAN uh, centrality. And, and of course, the fact that it is at the same time concurrently a member state of ASEAN and therefore uh, affects the, the way ASEAN's uh, uh, conduct itself and, and carry out its, its work. You know, on the latter point, uh, as, as I have mentioned before, the, the postponement of the retreat, ASEAN Foreign Minister's retreat uh, over the issue, arguably, um, is an example of how, if ASEAN is not careful, uh, it, the whole issue of Myanmar can, can hijack and can, can jettison uh, other very important ASEAN uh, cooperation and, and, and ASEAN should not allow itself to be, to, to be, to be put in this way and hence uh, the need for, for, uh, for, uh, uh, for urgent resolution of the, of the issue. And uh, the centrality of obviously this is a litmus test of the most, of the most uh, fundamental character uh, ASEAN can can't speak of its role in the Indo-Pacific and, and many other issues if it can't get uh, its own house in terms of Southeast Asia uh, in order. Uh, so I think there shouldn't be any mistaken, mistaking in terms of 
uh, the type of test that ASEAN is facing. But at the same time, uh, and, I, and I take it, this is based on your own personal experience in Myanmar, your first point is one well worth <laughs> underscoring uh, that uh, ultimately uh, no outside entity can find, you know, force, you didn't use that term, but, you know, force a solution on Myanmar, it is one that, uh, that will be, in, you know, resolved internally with uh, conditions conducive, perhaps, uh, from externally. In terms of, uh, you know, what kind of uh, the crisis over time, you know, I mean, in terms of ASEAN internally, it, it is affecting ASEAN uh, already at the moment in terms of ASEAN uh, unity. And, you know, in terms of, I, I think ASEAN needs, as I was uh, suggesting to Padon earlier, needs to really go beyond the five points and try to fill in the blanks or identify bullet points under each of those five principles that it has identified. It's, at the moment, I find a degree of convenience uh, from the nine ASEAN member states by saying, look, we are just waiting uh, and, and calling on the, the junta to deliver on these uh, five points and setting aside the fact that actually there are things that ASEAN, the other nine ASEAN countries can do vis-a-vis -vis the five points. And this is where, where I think uh, uh, there is a little bit of a, uh, a deficit of, of, of ideas uh, in terms of how to proceed. And, and in the rare moments when there is an attempt to be a little bit thinking outside the box and to be, to be a bit more times uh, urgent, uh, being done by the chair of ASEAN, where it was Brunei and now Cambodia, uh, the, one of the knee-jerk response by the other ASEAN member states uh, is one of like uh, not quite undermining, but uh, questioning, you know, like a public questioning of the efforts that being made. To me, that is a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit an ASEAN. I mean, I don't know whether you we read the going back and forth between. Uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen and the Foreign Minister of, of Malaysia, yeah. the type of language uh, right. that is being used to describe right. one another in ASEAN context, I think is quite quite remarkable, and yeah. <laughs> it, it is 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 it is quite remarkable the way we, we find ourselves. You know, if I was uh, sitting in an ASEAN uh, office somewhere, I would be thinking about what can. Uh, you know, bullet points that we can we can identify to follow up on those five points, and I think there are some steps. The uh, the uh, cessation of violence, as I said before, at the moment is dependent. It's it's uh, it's um, <clears throat> really reliant on the goodwill of the junta. Uh, I mean, if ASEAN, for instance, now begin to report. Um, regularly to the United Nations Security Council on a regular basis. These are the, the data, not by a report being convened by, gathered by some NGO and, and or think tanks, but by the ASEAN Secretariat of Commitment of Violence by whoever and submitted as a formal agenda in the United Nations Security Council under the appropriate agenda item. That is extremely powerful. And if I said before, if they were to constitute the ASEAN uh, embassies uh, in, in, in Napidao to have some kind of a, like a contact group uh, to, to, to open their doors, to meet with NUG leaders mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to re receive, mm -hmm. these are yeah. symbolic, but it's, it right. begins to show it is not only ASEAN and the junta. Uh, of course, we need to continue to call on uh, release of Aung San Suu Kyi, Dao Aung San Suu Kyi and others. But meanwhile, uh, while that kind of appeal is still being made, uh, uh, you know, we can do far more than simply uh, calling on, on, on the junta to deliver on the five points. But one point that I wanted to mention as well, Pascot, is that to me at the moment, in contrast to recent past, is that at least uh, the international community uh, so far is rallying around for whatever reason, uh, ASEAN's uh, <laughs> efforts. Uh, and, and they say like look, uh, ASEAN is, a, uh, there is no undermining of ASEAN's uh, efforts. Uh, everyone is trying to do the right thing and rallying around ASEAN. 
uh, it's only recently though I saw uh, the uh, when Prime Minister Hun Sen went to Napidao, uh, some of the neighboring countries of, uh, of I mean countries in Asia, uh, Japan in particular, for instance, had a, a little bit of a nuanced view uh, on whether this approach is a good idea or not. Uh, but yeah, it is it is a litmus test definitely for ASEAN. Yeah. I think one of the, yeah, thank you very thank you. much. I'm a, thank you also, Scott. I appreciate the question. If I can just say a couple of things on this, and then we got to move directly to other questions, uh, mm. not, not focused on Myanmar. Um, it seems to me that there's an irony here that perhaps ASEAN unity is actually an obstacle. In other words, mm. the preoccupation with ASEAN unity prevents us from considering the idea that you just put forward, which seems to me an excellent idea, which is that Indonesia, for example, tomorrow, I mean, that's mm. my term, not yours, tomorrow, <laughs> should recognize the NUG, or at least establish a relationship with the NUG, right? And see if other countries in the region, the Philippines perhaps, you know, maybe Malaysia, right? Could do the same. Uh, this would at least build pressure against the junta. Because remember the statement that violence should be ended. The only problem with that is that it ne neglects the fact that the junta began the violence and the junta has continued massive violence, right? Uh, and if jailing people, right, without any kind of legal recourse uh, is also violence, then is again, it's the fault of the junta, right? So I think the possibility, and take foreign countries, the United States. I mean, I've discussed this with, uh, with some, uh, at least indirectly in Washington, you know, maybe the United States should, should establish relations with the NUG. These are, I think, all appropriate uh, ideas uh, for consideration. Now, I want to change um, to the next question, which comes from the, uh, uh, the Q&A. We don't have a lot of time. We only have about uh, uh, maybe 15 or more minutes left. And it is, of course, a, a, a predictable question. Namely, what do you think Southeast Asia, and I suppose here this really illustrates the difference that you made between ASEAN and Southeast Asia, and the difference between ASEAN and Southeast Asia, it seems to me, is not just the difference as a result of the fact that Timor-Leste is not a member of ASEAN. That's a kind of formal distinction. But in fact, you know, <laughs> you know the millions and millions of people uh, who populate the region we call Southeast Asia, I mean, how many of them, if you ask them, what is ASEAN? Mm -hmm. Right? How many of them would be able to say, oh, that's the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, right? Mm -hmm. So here is a large, dynamic, living uh, community of individuals, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it does seem to me that the question of the impact of the rivalry between the United States and China on Southeast Asia and the relevance of that rivalry for Southeast Asia is really critical, as one of the questions in the QA raised this uh, particular topic. And I guess maybe I could focus it a little bit more by asking you, it is common to hear from Southeast Asians, and of course it varies from country to country admittedly, don't make us choose. Mm -hmm. Don't make us choose between the US and China. Now, I have to say that one of my problems with that statement is the extent to which it assumes moral equivalence between what is after all, let's be frank, a dictatorship in China Mm -hmm. And in the United States, a badly wounded democracy, but still a democracy, right? Mm -hmm. And, but anyway, I want to just put this on your, on your plate, as it were, and ask you, how should Southeast Asians approach this question of, you know, do you side with the US? Do you side with, uh, with China to, if you will, even try to manage, perhaps? I don't know, the rivalry? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I, did, I did make uh, reference uh, to such sentiment. Uh, in my initial uh, remarks, uh, Padron, that uh, it is not uncommon nowadays to hear, uh, first of all, uh, appeal for restraint uh, for both sides, US and China, to exercise restraint in their, in their rivalry, rivalry uh, and at the same time as well to express the hope that uh, uh, the, the wish that they be left alone, uh, that they be not forced uh, to choose. And in a way, to me, this is like the 21st century equivalent of the early days of ASEAN uh, that I referred to earlier, uh, when ASEAN was recently was then formed. Obviously, at, at the early years, uh, ASEAN was seen to be very much uh, uh, pro-West uh, because as Southeast Asia was then divided between the ASEAN and the non-ASEAN countries, pro-West uh, entity. But 
over time, it developed itself to become claiming neutrality, uh, not to choose sides and not to be to be embroiled in in then raging China U.S. Uh, Soviet uh, rivalry. Now that type of sentiment comes to the fore again, and this is what I said before. Uh, it is not sufficient uh, for ASEAN countries to simply to express that uh, that uh, hope because emotion is not policy. <laughs> it's not good enough for them to simply say that they are they don't want to be forced to choose. Uh, it is a fact of life that. The two countries, uh, uh, Russia, I mean, China and the United States are in intense uh, competition in a multi-faceted way, not only traditional security, but also in uh, technology, economy, finance. So it is increasingly a question that is going to be posed to us. Uh, in my view, uh, to be passive, for uh, ASEAN to be passive guarantees an ASEAN that will become uh, torn asunder. The, the ASEAN will, each ASEAN member countries will be picked out uh, by, by either Beijing or Washington to join uh, their side and we will begin to see fragmentation, the, uh, the, the uh, proliferation of uh, mini lateral processes uh, like the AUKUS and the, uh, uh, the Quad, et cetera, and, and ASEAN will become uh, dissected. To me, the, the, the main challenge, I mean, first of all, ASEAN must make the diversity of its foreign policy orientation, some close to China, some close to the United States, as being an asset, uh, as being uh, a, a plus for them rather than uh, mm -hmm. a factor that will divide them because ASEAN will then be able to have a multi-pronged uh, approach to all these different uh, major capitals and, and become almost by default uh, a, a party that has the that enjoys the comfort level from Beijing and from uh, Washington that we can be the uh, convener and even the the, uh, the manager of the, the regional common, uh, which we have until recently. I think until recently we have been able to do that because that's why you know I mean uh, countries the non-ASEAN member states were able to convene. Uh, regularly in ASEAN-led initiatives and, and processes, but the lack of ASEAN's utilization of these processes, whether it be East Asia Summit, ASEAN Regional Forum, make these processes increasingly irrelevant and, and questions being raised whether ASEAN can uh, deliver on its uh, uh, centrality uh, role and therefore in the end now is, is essentially uh, every country to itself and and uh, and uh, 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 we are where we are that's why i said asean needs to identify uh, you know assert its relevance i did try to suggest before uh, you know asean can try to help stabilize the rivalry not uh, wish it away but to have real pragmatic steps how can crisis be managed potential for crisis be managed by creating modalities uh, to that effect. But uh, it is, uh, at the moment, it's not the, uh, the high point of ASEAN's uh, uh, performance in this field uh, at the moment, to be honest, yeah. Okay, good. Well, let me just shift. Uh, we, we haven't talked as much as we might have about democracy. Mm -hmm. So let me remind our, our listeners, our viewers, uh, that Two years ago yesterday, uh, you were at the Sunnylands meeting, uh, which involved uh, a think tank in Washington, the National Endowment of Democracy. Um, I won't go into those details, except to say that the Sunnylands meeting that you attended generated what are called the Sunnylands principles. Principles meant to present democracy in a way that would be attractive and would be supported by, for example, Southeast Asians, right? As opposed to necessarily, you know, what uh, what Kishore Mahubani likes to disparage as, you know, the Anglo-Saxons, right? <laughs> Legalistic Anglo-Saxons, right? And uh, added to that is, of course, the fact of the American-sponsored, the Joe Biden-sponsored Summit for Democracy. Uh, and as you know, there will be a follow-up summit uh, at the end of this year, looking back on progress made. What do you think of this activity? 
I mean, is this just another example of the Americans pushing the line around the world, democracy, democracy, democracy? I mean, you know, that didn't work out too very well in Iraq, right? And some people are wondering if it's just time to stop doing that, right? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there are people who are committed to the, the value of democracy. I'm one of them. I think you are as well. Mm -hmm. um, but is this the best way to do it? What comments would you make on US foreign policy with regard to this issue, particularly in relation to Southeast Asia? Well, uh, you know, I mean, I, I genuinely believe that the conversation on protection and promotion of uh, democratic principles uh, is one that does, is something that needs to be had uh, between countries. Uh, it's not solely an internal uh, issue. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, I mean, first and foremost, uh, the if, uh, progress or otherwise of a country's uh, democratic uh, process is inherently internal in nature and there is not a one size fits all. Uh, but at the same time, there's always room for conversation and sharing of experience and lessons learned to be made by countries even that are diverse in their outlook. That's why Indonesia, I mentioned before, uh, we introduced the notion of uh, uh, discussing uh, issues to do with democratic governance, human rights, uh, democratic principles in ASEAN where it was absent before. We created something uh, that was completely absent. And although there is still obviously difficulties and strong challenges, at least the wherewithal uh, is there in terms of uh, conversation on the subject matter. And we also introduced the idea of the Bali Democracy Forum, uh, uh, which uh, again, tried to bring countries of the wider Asia Pacific to a conversation on uh, issues are relating to democracy. I know in the past there was a community of democracy that the United States had also introduced and now the latest one, the summit for democracy that the Biden administration had suggested. So I, I, I certainly welcome the fact uh, that there is uh, intergovernmental, inter international global processes and conversation on, on promotion and protection of democracy, uh, at the, but it has to be anchored on the recognition that ultimately this has to be synchronized with the national level, national level uh, development. It cannot be uh, you know, attempted or secured in isolation from uh, national processes. Uh, I did join the Sunnyland process. I think it is a, it is a stellar uh, effort to identify areas where countries, although despite their diversity can actually come together to, to discuss issues of common interest and the, the summit for democracy that the administration had introduced, uh, had, had last year. I think it's a very important process. And, and my only hope is that such a process can be sustained because uh, often case it is uh, intimately uh, linked with particular government or administration, whereas it is a sub, it is subject matter that needs a constant uh, nurturing and, and effort that can simply be turned on and off and on, uh, on and off as, as required. But I'm, 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 I welcome uh, the initiative by the Biden administration. But at the same time, uh, in a, to the point that I raised before at the beginning, uh, it is the reality that whenever it is about the messenger rather than the message, wh whatever is, issue it is, once it's taken up by the United States, you can almost guarantee, almost guarantee uh, there will be a response by the other side, meaning by China, as if any discussion of democracy must be uh, uh, like a, a, a part of the US-led project to undermine it. And this is where a country like Indonesia must find its own footing and say, look, this is nothing to do with uh, uh, geopolitical tensions. It is about uh, uh, promoting principles and ideas that we all subscribe to. Yeah, yeah thank you for that. That's, I think, an appropriate uh, point to end on, uh, especially insofar there might be a little optimism there <laughs> as opposed <laughs> to the pessimism that I think uh, many of us are, are feeling for various reasons, including the state of democracy in the United States, which oh. I'm not going to get into. Um, but I want to thank you. I want to thank you very much for your candor, for your responsiveness, uh, for who you are. Uh, I look forward to hearing more about you, especially when Indonesia takes over the chairmanship of, of ASEAN.
And I want to thank the audience. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of the uh, questions. I want to thank Scott for his question. And I also want to thank my, in, my invaluable uh, colleague, uh, Lisa Lee, who coordinates the Southeast Asia program and without whom uh, this never would have happened. Thank you all, especially you, Marty. Thank you. Thanks so much indeed. Thank you for having me. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.